Welcome to American Architecture Now. I am Barbara Lee Diamondstein, and our guest this evening is Charles Guathme, who is widely known for his elegant houses and thoughtful solutions to institutional buildings, as well as very fine examples of interior design. Guathme Siegel is now one of the city's leading architectural firms, designing new housing for Columbia University in Roosevelt Island, office buildings, and several large houses very warm welcome to you. Thank you. You were once a member of the so-called New York Five Architects, otherwise known as the White Architects. But unlike your colleagues, uh, Richard Meyer and Michael Graves, who have spoken to us recently here, your work was never pure white. Does that have to do with the fact that after studying at the University of Pennsylvania, you went to the Yale School of Architecture from which you were graduated, and that school has fostered, at least nominally, a respect for the specifically American context and the practical necessities of construction. The point is, how did you manage to go to Yale and then become a white instead of a gray? Well. <laughs> You don't plan your life that way. I mean, I didn't know New York Five was going to exist. Uh, I didn't know I was going to go to Yale. And I didn't know it was going to mean anything now, right? Uh, but I should, I'd like to make a comment about the New York Five just to clarify it. It's not a school. Uh, it was a publication that Peter Eisenman, who is the head of the Institute of Architecture and Urban Studies, decided to do. And the, the, the most important thing about it was that I think it, it began uh, the whole discussion among architects, teachers, and students about the ideas of architecture. And for the first time in a long, long time, uh, people began debating uh, and talking about buildings again, and buildings as ideas and buildings as art. And from that point of view, it was a very pertinent document, and many people afterwards start deciding to make separations and putting people in schools and putting people in groups and talking about people being gray or white or whatever. Uh, I don't know about the gray or white stuff. Is there any distinction? Is it imaginary or is it real between the two groups? Oh yes, I think that the, I think the original five architects, and I think there could certainly be other people <laughs> included, uh, were really interested in the European intellectual base of, of architectural ideas, and the so-called other group uh, was more interested in the American vernacular and the, that, that tradition. And I think the two, the two points of view are different. Uh, there are overlaps, but I would say one was very literal, the American point of view, and the other was tends, tended to be more abstract. One was, one was representational and the other was not in that sense. And I think as an idea that, that, that was the difference. And it made a lot of people very upset, which I never understood. Did you ever quite fit into that <coughs> New York Five group, which was six before it was publi publicly proclaimed five? Because from the time that the book uh, was put together in its publication, you had taken a partner, Robert Siegel. Did you ever really fit into that group since you were always profoundly interested in built work? Well, like I said, it wasn't a group. Uh, we, were, we were all associated uh, through teaching. And we've been friends and not friends over the years. Uh, What's the current status? The current status is that we all communicate and uh, are, looking <laughs> are looking at the work and uh, criticizing and not, and uh, really have... We, it's interesting, about a month ago, we all had dinner together to celebrate John Haydock's show. And it was, a, it was a marvelous evening because John told stories and everybody told stories about how and why it got to be. And in retrospect, it's, uh, it's fairly, fairly amazing that it ever got to be. Um, and we all laughed about it, you know, because it was a kind of a time and a kind of an incident and it provoked enough interest uh, to make what's happening today available. What's happening today meaning that there's a huge debate about architecture and its relevance 
and postmodernism and how it relates, if it does, and so forth. So you really never expected the media or the profession to proclaim what you were doing as a specific school? No. I mean, I think that's interesting. I think that's... Uh, How did that, that happen? I think there's an insecurity about identification, and uh, people like to identify groups or like to have code names. It's more efficient, and it seems simpler. But I never thought it was very simple. I don't think any of the work is very simple either. We have been talking here with Frank Gehry, and as you know, his interest in the industrial aesthetic in many ways contrasts very sharply with your great concern for materials, except yours are expensive and rich. The wood of the cabinet work, the glass of the walls, the metal of the details, all seem to celebrate with a very great precision these materials. Why do you choose those materials and are you trying to convey something in their use? Can I make a statement before I answer the question? I disagree. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that what our work has relied on historically is that we have also used industrial materials and products that are available and we've tended to reinterpret their use and developed a kind of an aesthetic uh, with a specific reuse of these materials and they appear to be refined and they may appear to be expensive and so forth but that's not that's not the intention uh... the intention for instance glass block uh... uh... metal pan ceilings which historically have been used in kitchens uh... restaurant kitchens um, uh... all of the so-called metals that you say look so so refined are all available products that have uh... that have other value implications aesthetically that have been placed upon them, right? And what we have tried to deal with is to take these materials and re-involve them perceptually, put them in a different context, and they take on a new life. And therefore, you identify them as being fancy. And I don't know if that was exactly the word I used. Refined but and rich. Um, Paul Rudolph says, and he agrees with you, and I would agree with this as well, that your work can be read in many ways and is simultaneously many things. Is there a particular theory or ideology that would describe your style? Mine? My work, our work, um, uh, really, I think, has to do with being intensely responsive to the programmatic issues to the site constraints, to an idea that a building uh, must perform its role and then to transcend that and become a work of art. Now, that's not a style as, a, as an idea. That's an attitude about architecture. And I, I think, really, our process deals very much with understanding the problems and trying to uh, establish the hierarchies and the priorities in a problem and then legitimately uh, going about solving that problem with a certain, I hope, clear attitude about the manifestation of that problem into an object. So how it gets to be what it looks like is as pragmatic as the process is, actually. I mean, we learn as we build and we believe in building. Are there any architects to whose work you especially respond who have heavily influenced your work? Um, I, I, actually, uh, I actually respond a great deal to Frank, Frank's work uh, and to him, actually. I think Jim Sterling, the English architect, uh, has had the most influence on me, uh, not necessarily stylistically, but as someone who believes in the building ethic and has used uh, what, again, I would call industrial materials or industrial systems and has been able to put them together in a most unique uh, and, I would say, pragmatic way. And, of course, I look back to, to Corbusier and Frank Lloyd Wright um, as being, being very influential on the way we think about space. 
how has your own basic design vocabulary evolved in the 10 years that Gwathmi Siegel has been in practice? I think initially, um, when we began in the 60s, uh, there, there was uh, a great, at least as I look back on it, a great gap between what the ideal was and what the condition was. In other words, the war, I was teaching school, uh, students were upset, uh, they couldn't face the rigors and they couldn't understand the discipline of, of, of architecture. Uh, um, the idea of, of uh, our having assassinations, uh, problems with, with the political system, all sort of made me at least pull back from that kind of identification. And I think the architecture was very, very Jesuit in that sense. It, it sort of stripped itself, became extremely abstract, relied totally on its own uh, sort of exposure and, and, and was in fact uh, minimal. And as time goes on and as one learns and continues, um, I think it's it's at a point now where it's being uh, reevaluated both by us and by people that work with us, and we're interested in the re-enrichment of the of the work, uh, making it more complex, uh, but also at the same time holding to the clarity and to the rigor of the spatial order. And I think they are consistent, and they are growth ideas that the old work is not illegitimate and it has still has a, a very a very strong influence on the present work well why don't we talk about one of your buildings that has had a strong influence on houses in fact houses of our time and it was your first really major construction it may even have been your first major project and that is the house and studio that you did for your parents, your father, the distinguished easel painter, Robert Gwathney, and your mother, Rosalie Gwathney, a photographer, that you did in Amagansett uh, in 1967. That certainly turned out to be one of the more influential houses of our time. It, the house itself is a composition of cubes and cylinders with slanted roofs and vertical wood siding. How does this house look to you now? Looks terrific. Well, what do you think of its imitators? Uh, I don't think about that. I really, I, I, if you start thinking about imitators, then uh, you start thinking about problems and it gets insidious and you stop doing what you're supposed to be doing. How differently, if at all, would you do that house now? Uh, that's an impossible question. Uh, I. I think I think that house is is uh, is strong because it's responsive. Um, it was so clear and so small, and it's a composite of a whole education and a whole experience I had, and it was an opportunity that uh, that was perfect. And my parents were perfect clients. I mean, they really wanted me to make a work and they were supportive. As artists themselves, with singular points of view, did they collaborate with you on that work? No, not, not at all. They were, uh, they were actually uh, removed, from, removed uh, from the participation more so than, than other clients, or more so than's typical. And, you know, they, we had a piece of land and they had a certain amount of money and no, no contractor would touch it uh, in Long Island, and I wound up building it myself with some people, some workers from Brooklyn, who we all went out and built the building. It cost $35,000. Well, that's uh, 26 houses and 13 years ago, because you are currently building a house in a neighboring community, a summer house for a client currently, and that costs approximately one and one half million dollars. Do you consider this house a summary of your other work? Oh, that's interesting because it's hard to talk about. It's hard to talk about architecture and not see it. Uh, but what 
what happens, I think, when you teach and when you reflect about what you make and you have an opportunity like this, uh, we always consider houses buildings. In other words, our, our houses uh, have a tendency to be more general about ideas. They, they, they talk about orientation and view and sight and weather and how they're built and so forth. They, have, they tend to have less to do uh, with the specific personality uh, 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 of the clients in the sense that they start identifying those specifics. They're, they're really buildings. And, th and this house uh, has afforded us an opportunity always, of course, having gone through a sequence of, of learning and building other buildings uh, that does make a summary. And uh, it's very rich programmatically. Uh, uh, the, the, the two people in our office uh, that are working with us are, are young and energetic and smart as hell and they are making us push all the time uh, to confront all the issues that we've touched or, or missed uh, in our sort of history and it's become a very a very pertinent growth period and I think it's going to be at least I hope it's going to be uh, if it's worth it a summary of, of all the other buildings. Can you describe some of the issues that you are confronting there? And perhaps you might also tell us about this rich program to which you refer, the spatial horizontal layering plan. The, the interesting thing to me is that, uh, is that historically, we were very interested in the object, uh, the architecture as an object. And that was clearer and more accurately responded to when the program was smaller. And you could really composite a building and you could make a composite object that was highly articulated uh, and so forth and going through uh, the processes uh, we've we found that sometimes we've had to uh, pull the building apart uh, sometimes the building uh, no longer became an object perceptually but it, it did something else it maybe made a place and there's been this kind of conflict with me to ultimately get back to the richness of the object or the clarity of the object at the same time having it be as complex as a place and doing both simultaneously. So with all of the, all of the uh, complexity of program, uh, a greenhouse in the building, uh, five bedrooms, a library, a sitting room, a projection room, I mean it's a fancy thing, you know. <laughs> You, you put all this together, uh, like in my parents' house, as an intention to make an object. And that's what's terribly exciting about it. And it's also very confronting. I mean, every intersection, every, every layer, every, every spatial move, uh, 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 both vertically and horizontally, have an amazing impact on how the building develops and how finely it's perceived. And that's been, been a great opportunity to have. Well, you speak about this opportunity, about the opportunity of the ideal client, which I assume doesn't happen very often. I didn't the, say it was an as, ideal no, client. No, as in the instance of your parents. <laughs> oh, that's true. But while you're talking about this client, let us talk about the relationship between architect and client, particularly in a project such as this, a summer residence, a part-time residence. Uh, how it, much... I don't think you should make a value judgment about that. Well, I mean, if you say part-time resident, summer resident, that implies that, at least to me, that it's less pertinent somehow. Not you, one. Right? When one says you're building a summer residence and it's extravagant, that that's a value judgment. And I don't think architecture should ever have a value judgment. Well, I was really referring to location okay. more than to price and extravagance. No, no, but you know what I'm saying? I do. <laughs> I, think a, I think a work of art is a work of art, whether it's used in the summer or whether it's perceived by people walking down the beach or in an airplane. The idea is the process is critical and the fact that the object uh, is perceived by however many is important. And whether it's summer or winter or year-round should not be an issue. At least it's not an issue for me. Well, let's talk about the client and what okay. is an issue for him or her. Um, how much should the, how much of the job should emerge out of the problem as the client has defined it? How much of 
any such project is the result of a preconceived style or notion. How responsive can one really be to the needs of a client in doing a house without really overstepping your own bounds and what you intend to do? Well, uh, two things. One is that I, I believe that a client would come to an architect like us or like any of the other people that you're talking to because they're either familiar with the work, uh, they have an affinity to it, uh, they respond to it. Initially. Uh, initially. It doesn't uh, always work out that way, mm -hmm. as we all know. No, but I mean, I've, I think it's been fairly consistent that people who have heard of us that don't know our work uh, are either shocked immediately or disappear, right, or stay, right? It's really not a middle ground. So the, the, this client did know the work. Uh, and what we tend to do, since we do teach and since we feel that we're obligated to talk about the art ultimately and to make the piece of art is that we we find out all the all the programmatic issues all of the all of the likes and dislikes all the hates all the preconceptions we really really want to know um, and it's sometimes less or more extreme and we sort of make that a body of information and then we talk about the site and we talk about the whys and the wherefores of what the view is what the privacy is and so forth talk about basic organizational possibilities, which all come about as very factual things to me. They're not preconceptions, they're not, uh, they're not things that uh, are automatically going to make, make a design, but they're things you have to understand. And when you put this together with a point of view, and the point of view comes from that piece of information and the site and where it is and how you build, uh, you start to make a work. And our tendency is to be very informative, maybe over-informative to the client as to why we're doing something. And I think it's part of, of educating, and I don't mean it negatively, but educating the client because he is or she is or they are a participant in the process in the sense that they are ultimately going to be the initial user. And to have the experience of learning why something got to be what it got to be when it's something that's so private it's not treated necessarily that way, is an experience that should, should, should be had. And I think we're very responsive to making sure the client, at the risk of uh, overexposing ourselves maybe too, too fast or too far initially, uh, to have that experience. And they become terribly supportive and terribly involved in the ultimate expression, and they want it to be as far as we can make it. Uh, they want us to extend ourselves because we're extending them. And it becomes a mutual support system, which is, which is the only way. You are especially interested in the inside and the outside. And one of the houses that you have done that is referred to as a renovation, and I'm talking about the Kislevitz House in West Hampton, is essentially a new building. It's also an interesting lesson in assemblage and in fixed elements and the, I guess, intricate interpenetration of space. Can you tell us something about the design motif of that house? Well, well we, we sort of, uh, again, take any problem that offers a design opportunity. And, and that building was one of these old Spanish-style neo-colonial uh, neo uh, white elephants that was literally dropped on the sound uh, in West Hampton that had no view of the water that was totally dark and was really a very strange a very strange assemblage of, of, of Spanish tile roofs and configurations and the real the real pertinent part of, of, of doing that building uh, was to first understand how it got to be put together the way it did uh, to find the organizing, uh, the organizing principles of the, of the basic building itself, and then to reweave, literally, a brand new program and a brand new building within it, and also without it. I mean, extend it and also work within it. And I think constraints are very important. Uh, they're, they're positive because they allow you to work off something. So that the constraint that we established was to keep the roof configuration, all of the different roof configurations, uh, and to basically keep the original foundations and to work off of those two items uh, to intensify the, 
the basic, uh, the basic strength of the original building by modulating it with a whole new environment and a whole new set of forms. And it's really the most, the most uh, intense kind of juxtaposition that one could have. I mean, I always say if I, if I don't make that roof, I can work off of it. Uh, so that you're doing two things at the same time, something which I would be more hesitant to do if I started from scratch. Well, I know you are interested in an architecture of permanence, but why wouldn't you in a project such as that start from scratch? Because his wife liked the building. She liked the old Spanish tile roofs. And she had a, uh, she had a vision of a, of a southern plantation house, which is not bad. Um, so that was, you know, that what, was fine. What did you get? She got a southern plantation house. Uh, On the outside? No, no, no. She got the whole thing. I mean, it, it, it's terrific. Uh, you know, southern plantation house only means that, I think, that uh, it's a building that establishes a sense of place. It has a certain, a certain presence. Uh, it has a program which is accommodative. It participates with the land, uh, and it offers itself to the user. Uh, as being a rich establishment. I don't mean rich, money rich, I mean rich perceptually place, right? And, uh, you know, the reinterpretation, which is all art is anyway and all architecture keeps doing, the reinterpretation of, of history, is that's what it's doing. So I think she got it. And, and we the, got it. And what's the difference between building and architecture? B building, uh, building by definition is, is is making shelter, uh, and building is building is construction. Uh, architecture is design, and hopefully art. So there's a big difference from my point of view. You said made reference to history. What is the historical responsibility of the architect? I th well, from our point of view, the the responsibility is to understand the principles uh, of 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 the history of architecture not necessarily the, the stylistic uh, implications, but the, the, the reasons why buildings or towns or whatever were, were organized and how they were organized. And it's interesting when, for me when you think of a courthouse, which is the oldest organizational idea we know, you go to Pompeii, and then you go to the Renaissance Palazzo, and then you keep going, and if you just sort of understand why they, why they are and, why they, and how they got to be, that, uh, that principle uh, can be reinstituted, uh, redefined, yet with the same logic and the same consistency today. In other words, it would be a very valid proposition to design a courthouse if the site and if all of the other constraints implied that that was a legitimate solution. You are not implying that historical quotation is a legitimate solution for today's... I'm not interested in historical quotation per se as a stylistic idea. I keep doing my finger like a pediment, but I, I didn't... <laughs> uh, no, I, I, I like to understand it, but, uh, but I also uh, prefer not to apply it. Uh, it's been said that in part your firm's success is due to your relationship with your partner, your high school classmate and chum from the High School of Music and Art, Robert Siegel. Did you know way back then that you would share such common ground? How did the partnership come about? Well, we played ball together in high school. <laughs> and he went away to school and I went away to school and we came back at Edward Barnes's office. Uh, he was an associate and was very happy uh, with that state of his life and I always had uh, the fix to open up my own office and my parents house came about at that time and I left Ed's office and, uh, and sooner or later uh, some work was there and uh, I went and talked to Bob and the amazing thing about the partnership I think is that we're both highly competitive and goal-oriented uh, as people, but we're not competitive with each other. And it's a fantastic relationship because we, I really think we over-complement each other and we work together. 
and it's a it's an amazing kind of kind of condition. Well, it's nice. It's an interesting reference to it as a condition. Let's talk a little bit further about that working relationship with Robert Siegel. In the design for the Thomas and Bett building, the vice president of the company was quoted as saying, um, and he said, sometimes Charles Gwathmi would make what I thought were pie-in-the-sky proposals, but Robert Siegel and I would modulate them and make them work within the budget. Is that the way it often works? No, no that's press. <laughs> well, that's tell the, it. That's the five architects people. That's talking. architectural records yeah, speaking. That, yeah. <laughs> and no, the I, vice president, your client. How does it work? What's the reality of the well, situation I think that, on an uh, ongoing basis? Are you both involved in the design of each project? We're both involved in the design uh, uh, all the way through. Uh, we work with, uh, with the other people in the office, and the more involved they get, the better, the better we are, I think. And uh, I, think, I think the real difference is, is that my energies, uh, uh, as opposed to Bob's, can can go off on tangents and I can I can tend to think about a lot of things at the same time and he uh, happily so can really likes to concentrate on a single thing at a single time and from that point of view we we can get together and you know I mean I, what people say about how people work is really funny I mean we we both come in and we work and we love we love to do buildings and we work well together. And he may modulate the vice president from Thomas and Betts, and I may modulate the president from Columbia University in another way, right? Did you have to do that? Because uh, it seems to me that one of the things we should address ourselves to now is a project that has been engaging your interest for the, and your energies for the last three years, and that is the $18 million residential and academic cloister that you have designed for the Columbia University campus. Since you had a, an entirely new notion of how to deal with students, your intent, I have read, was to deal with students as individuals instead of students as categories. In what respect did you have to, if you did, modulate the president of Columbia University? Well, that's an interesting project because it's our first major <coughs> New York urban project. It's, a, it's, it's terribly intense because its constraints and the existing conditions of the Columbia fabric, the Morningside Park. Uh, very complex program. Columbia is a very, uh, very dense client in terms of its layers of, 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 of authorities. And uh, what, what we really tried to do was to understand that the dormitory per se was no longer a viable building type and that a student uh, needs and should have the same amenities uh, as one who would go out and rent an apartment. Basically that simple. And so the building was organized about privacy and about really four, four students in private rooms sharing a common living dining kitchen. And uh, developed from that point of view the idea of the student identification, uh, his sense of place in an architectural organization that was at once small, a college or a building, and then related to a university. So that all of those things were important. And during the design, uh, which was the first design, was approved by the Board of Trustees and the President. And Bob and I got drunk one night and uh, looked at each other and both said that we thought Columbia was awful. You mean the project yeah, that you had designed? Yeah, right, and, and uh, that we were pressured uh, falsely into, into proposing what we had and that we felt like we should redesign it. And uh, when we presented that to the president, we were almost fired. Instead of being loved, we were hated. And, uh, but in the end, it works out. I mean, that, that's, that's an absolute... If, you should never build, and I don't think any artist would ever, ever paint or any sculptor would ever make something he didn't believe in. And we couldn't, we have to believe in it to do it, no matter, I mean, no matter how big or how small. I think that's, that's the difference between a builder and an architect. This project is, uh, addresses many urban questions. You told us that you have duplexes and triplexes and large interior spaces. They're obviously economically advantageous to, in terms of maintenance to the university in the long run. 
But there are other urban questions that you would have had to address. Can you tell us something about that? For example, how did you resolve the scale of the existing site, and how did you integrate the new construction into an academic center such as Columbia that had very distinct characteristics of its own? Well, it has very strange distinct characteristics. It has uh, the initial sort of Beaux-Arts scheme of McKim, Mead, and White, and then some very, very, uh, very bad, I think, uh, buildings that were designed in the 40s and 50s, um, names not mentioned, but really did not support uh, the sort of master plan intentions and really created a whole, a whole new uh, 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 level of, of occupation. Columbia is funny because when you walk around it, uh, it's a building, it's a campus built on solid bases. Uh, all the buildings have these very intense solid bottoms and you you are aware uh, consciously that uh, that it's intended to exclude the neighborhood uh, either perceptually psychologically or physically and we we came to a condition where there was a new platform level that was elevated off off of the street off of the New York City street and that whole relationship of how to 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 make the connection uh, between the Columbia campus level and the New York City level and the implications about neighborhood and about Columbia opening itself back up to, to the neighborhood, et cetera, uh, had a very critical, uh, critical sort of programmatic part to, to, to determining how the building was organized. And, and the building or the group of buildings is really a complex uh, that is at one time an edge to the grid, to the New York City grid on Morningside Park. It's a gateway to the campus. Uh, it ties in a whole lot of, at, at, at before, a whole lot of separate buildings and entrances that had no sense of, of, of identity of place. You just sort of found them. Uh, and it also really does make a major outdoor space on its own, uh, a court space, which organizes uh, the entire plan. Uh, and it speaks to it speaks to issues uh, that run the gambit of, of the urban scale, from underground parking to, you know, safety. living safety to security. Mm -hmm. uh, and when you look at it, it looks very simple. Uh, it's, it's really about a cloister. And the notion of a cloister is that you enter it and you are then in your own domain. And all of the entrances and all of the, all of the houses are working off of that central space, both actually and perceptually. And that's a device, which is not new. But what is new is the dormitory, which is the first one that Columbia University has constructed in more than 20 years. That's new. That's the kind of job that usually goes to larger or more commercially oriented architectural firms. How did you get that assignment? Uh, Jim Polchek was the dean at Columbia. <clears throat> and, and a very important, so I think any architecture school should have a practicing and design-oriented dean, because not only does the school become uh, involved in the idea of design, but he has a certain uh, a certain impact as a dean upon the decisions, uh, the building decisions that a university makes, and that's the first time I think in a long time that uh, the architecture school was was a, a participant, and he made a list of the architects that he thought would be responsive and you know we were so charming we got the job the university setting provides a particular opportunity and i assume a particular obligation for design both at columbia university and a very important renovation in fact an award-winning one uh, that you are responsible for at princeton university and there was the burnt out Wig Hall, where you worked out juxtapositions of old and new scales and old and new monumentality. I wonder if you could tell us both about that building and the obligation and opportunity that you think an architect has when working especially in a university setting. Well, if, if you're a teacher and you're also a student because you learn from students and you learn by teaching and you also learn from what you make, 
the, the Whig Hall opportunity was wonderful because it, uh, it spoke uh, to the classic sort of precedences of a building organization, a temple building, uh, and a, a brand new program in 1970 uh, came about, and it was how to reconcile, at least from our point of view, not, res not restoring the old building, at least internally, to what it used to be, because that would not have been accommodative, uh, but to literally build a new building within the old building, saving it, at least saving the critical pieces, uh, to, to speak to the relevancies of, of historical precedences and the quality uh, of certain, certain pieces historically, and to use the opportunity uh, to try to develop a dialogue between the possibility of maintaining the critical pieces of old and uh, critical pieces of new, and to have them work, uh, I would say, satisfactorily. Uh, and also being in a university, obviously the opportunity uh, for students to learn from that possibility, both during construction and to use the building, gives it a kind of exposure uh, which it ordinarily wouldn't have. So the university is a laboratory, and I think a wonderful place and challenging place to build buildings. It is not only a challenge, but obviously instructional in nature. I've often wondered if the fact that your father was a painter and such a widely recognized one, had any influence on your own work as an architect? I, I don't think, I don't think it, has, uh, it has an impact on why it looks like it looks, but he and my mother certainly had a powerful, uh, a, a powerful impact on me. Um, being both visually, in the visual arts and having their studios in our house always. I was constantly exposed to that life um, and understood, I think, that uh, the idea of making something or creating something was pertinent and satisfying. And my father taught at Cooper Union and I watched a way of life and lived a way of life. And they, were, they, they forced me to, to be exposed. Uh, they made me go to every museum and every cathedral in Europe when I was 11 with them, against my wishes. You prefer uh, to go alone? I prefer not to go <laughs> at the time. Uh, but, you know, that, 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 had, uh, that had real meaning. I mean, I don't know if I understood what I was looking at, but I certainly obviously had a different sense about it and a remembrance of it because I documented it. I drew, I bought postcards, I made notes, I remembered just for my own uh, uh, sort of recollection and and they've always been terribly supportive of the idea uh, uh, that I be I not be I not be something else besides an artist and uh, I, you know I mean that I think that's direct in one of their uh, the, one of their profound influences, obviously, is the Southern landscape, where you, in fact, were born in North Carolina yourself. I wondered if you can in picture the evolution of the Southern reference to your own work. To the work? It's hard to do it to the work. I think subconsciously, uh, again, is that the buildings, our buildings tend to visually and actually uh, uh, re-participate in the land. The, the whole notion that they become extensions of and take in uh, the land is, 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 is an important idea. Um, and recently, uh, the, the sort of inclusion in our work, at least the last three buildings, uh, uh, have talked to a, a screen porch as a major kind of space, an extension of both an indoor and an outdoor space, a sort of uh, collecting space between the inside and the outside. And I, I guess one could make, could make the connection. I, I never really thought about it that way, but I still do have, uh, I still do have roots uh, and a certain amount of passion for the South. Well, obviously. I think it's very honest. You were able to satisfy Mrs. Kislevitz's need for a plantation yeah, house with some actually. ease. <laughs> Have you ever collaborated with an artist yourself? No. <laughs> Would you like to? I'm not sure. Uh, I sort of agreed with Frank 
about that. I thought he said it very well. That uh, Frank Gehry. Frank Gehry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That uh, that collaboration automatically uh, automatically uh, at least implies a compromise. Um, and I too wouldn't uh, would never consider, as I think I told you one time. Uh, uh, the idea that artists put or sculptors put a piece in front of a building to sort of make the building more relevant and that's really why they do it it's why clients buy art because the architecture is not what it should be so the art sort of makes it uh, more acceptable uh, it's an especially cynical view particularly for an yeah. artist's office no I was thought the cynical view is that of the is, is that of why people purchase art in that in that context you know, I don't think uh, the Picasso in Chicago's Hancock building uh, had to do with a collaboration. I think it had to do with one person building a building and one person buying an object. And there they are. And it's fantastic. But in the future, particularly as we know now, either by gentlemen's agreement because of the General Services Administration or mandate in 17 cities and about 21 states, in fact, legislation that is now in f at least about to be marked up for as federal legislation for one half to one percent of construction costs for art that that process of collaboration willy-nilly could should must take place what do you envision as its future and its possibilities well as an architect I have to I have to sort of uh, I have to sort of say that that, that if that's real, and if one believes uh, in, in the artist participating and enriching a space, which, is, which certainly one can believe in, uh, is that as one designs buildings and one thinks about perception, uh, I, would, I would respond uh, in, 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 in considering that an integral part of the program and an integral part of the process and almost in an architectonic sense understand that that could be a possibility and a reality and 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 think about it on that on those terms right mm -hmm. and i don't want to sound like it's accommodating uh but i don't think that i could ever design a space simultaneously with an artist for the sake of that I think I well, could do Could design. you envision any relationship with an artist? Oh, sure. I mean, I, 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 in other words, if, if, uh, if the I mean, I think an architect that designs a museum uh, or a gallery or an apartment or a house that is going to, going to house or have mm -hmm. art is that, is that one has to think about it and think about it positively. And, uh, but that doesn't mean that there's a collaboration on that level in the design, at least the initial level. I, I find that problematic. It's because you don't want to take external cues from someone else's intention. I, no, I think that uh, I think that I never. I really don't think that way. I'm not saying I couldn't think that way. Uh, let's say I haven't thought that way. Uh, that I think that uh, that the buildings that we're making are on their own terms uh, are uh, 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 certainly objects. Uh, and 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 have many uh, many implications about about form and sculpture and everything that we would identify or define as art. And I never I never thought that they would rely or be necessarily uh, uh, beholden to a collaboration. Circulation circulation seems to be at the heart of your design. The spaces in between. I suppose that includes the process of layering space. Would you say that your, the whole notion of layering and that in general and your spaces specifically are becoming more densely layered? I think as the programs become more complex, the opportunity to layer space becomes more available. Uh, I think there's a difference between talking about layering s of space. Space is a three-dimensional and a volumetric uh, element and layering per se is not necessarily at least the way it's being used by other practitioners has a different implication it's not about layering space but about layering planes or layering surfaces mm -hmm. and our, our 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 tendency is to 
uh, try to re-enrich the space rather than the surface necessarily. And it's the whole interpenetration of, of the spatial lock uh, uh, and overlap and intersection that is interesting for us. I mean, the, our buildings are volumetric. Uh, they are, they are space-reliable. Space and, and, and they are less about uh, the so-called applied surface notion of enrichment than they are about, on their own terms, the nature and the whys and the wherefores of the space. One of the ways that you extend that enrichment is with your very skillful use of interior design. Do you ever conceive of interior and exterior design as was done during the 19th century? You have to help me. When they were done simultaneously. Well, we do, yeah. I, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I, we would never, we don't think that the eye really separates and that, uh, that a building which is talking about transparencies and talking about inside and outside simultaneously, uh, one could not but design them simultaneously and perceive them simultaneously. But you have done interior designs we've exclusive done, of yeah, exterior. Right, we've done extensive interior designs and the opportunity there, very much like the Kislevitz house, which is working within constraints and working within a given reference, uh, is to really explore uh, the notion of one's perception of space, to make environments, uh, to, to, to use that, that opportunity as a kind of learning laboratory about things which you would not tend to, at least we would not tend to, initiate in a new building. And the whole design of interiors uh, uh, for us has been another sort of piece in the puzzle to help us, again, understand how we can re-enrich uh, and make more complex the new buildings that we're doing now so that they do feed upon and support one another. Do you feel restricted when you have to respond to the client's demands in no. that kind of situation? No, no I'm, glad to, I'm glad to have it. I think the most impossible, uh, the impossible problem is to design it in a vacuum. No program, no site. Uh, that would be, that would be uh, almost, almost impossible for me to conceive. And the more information we have, uh, the more so-called constraints we have, uh, the clearer the opportunity is, and the clearer the references are, the clearer and more supportive and more accurate the design is going to be. What are your best unbuilt projects, and why weren't they built? I don't know. Best unbuilt projects was probably uh, started with a house we did in Malibu, uh, which sort of reinterpreted the whole notion of the strip, uh, the edge, and making a building that was layered that was really a row house but an object and it started to deal with the ocean side and the road side and that whole notion of strip architecture uh, which which didn't happen we tried to reapply the same principles about a year ago on another house that didn't get built and Have you abandoned that plan <laughs> no but the same the same sort of party the, the, that you know it's very you know all houses all buildings have references some some buildings that are detached have urban implications. In other words, a building on an ocean, uh, on a dune, where there are a lot of buildings all lined up for the specific state of the view and, and the edge, right, are really, are really no different conceptually than row houses. And uh, if you conceive of the implication and the urban implications of that, you would tend to design a building in a line differently than you would design a building in the middle of a field and yet exploit the good or the positive uh, and the richness of both and try to make them simultaneous. So, but I don't think about unbuilt things. I think that uh, when you design something and you go through the process, that it's just another, it's another important piece in, 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 one's, in one's development. And you always want them, at least I do, want to build them. Uh, but I'm also happy that we had an opportunity to go through the process because it still informs. And that's just what you've done for us this evening. Thank you very much, Charles Guathme, for being with us. <laughs>